the wealth of some nations. Section. Social Democracy and Colonialism Before the First World War. Renowned social historian and Trotskyist Fritjof Tickelmann, 1929-2012, has demonstrated that whereas internationalism within Europe itself was a marginal phenomenon, in colonial matters it was even less influential. He argues that Dutch and British labor took a relatively liberal approach to colonial reform compared with the nationalist colonialism of French socialists and the nationalist imperialism of the right wing of German social democracy from around 1907. In all four cases, however, fear of losing international status ensured that the left consistently preferred national conservatism to anti-colonial revolution. For Tickelmann, Marx's view of the struggle leading to world socialist society was inspired by a naive sort of liberal economism, the view that the inexorable global expansion of capitalism would erode all national barriers and create a revolutionary working class in all countries. Although Marx's teleological determinism was tempered in later years through his studies of Russian agriculture and the possibility that Russia may be able to bypass strictly capitalist development, as well as by his observation of the negative role colonialism in Ireland played within British working class politics, it was Leninism that first elaborated the prospect that it was the least developed capitalist countries that would pave the way to socialism. For mainstream social democracy, capitalism was seen as a necessary and civilizing force for progress in the underdeveloped areas of the world, although its directly colonial form was not necessarily to be celebrated. Accordingly, the first International Working Men's Association, IWMA, did not occupy itself with colonial or non-Western matters, and it did not explicitly extend the principle of national self-determination beyond Europe and America. The growth of powerful labor institutions and organizations, and the wave of strikes witnessed in the final quarter of the 19th century, did not preclude the integration of leading elites and layers of the working class in the ruling apparatus of bourgeois European and American society. Indeed, in no small measure as a result of its incorporation within imperialist institutions. The labor movement as a whole decidedly failed the test of internationalism, providing little or no support to the national liberation struggles in the colonies and vouchsafing the militarism of Europe's rival ruling classes. Insofar as the labor movement concerned itself with colonialism at all, the colonial policy of the Second International was largely pacifist and humanitarian, prioritizing the prevention of war occurring as the outcome of great power rivalry around imperialist expansion, and secondarily, the ostensibly humanitarian need to protect, educate, and civilize the natives of the colonies. Whereas before the Seventh Congress in Stuttgart, August 1907, the parties of the Second International tended to view these broad goals as best achieved under the ambit of moderate anti-colonialism. Afterward, they shifted their strategy to one of reforming colonial practices. In the case of the SPD, Sozialdemokratische Partei Deutschlands, in Germany, this shift may in part be traced to significant parliamentary losses suffered by the party during the so-called Hottentot elections of earlier that year. When the SPD, alongside the Catholic Center Party, took a principled stand by denying support for government funding for the suppression of the Nama Rebellion in Germany's southwest Africa colony, modern-day Namibia, it was subjected to a concerted political campaign calling into question its patriotic and democratic credentials. From then on, the liberation of the oppressed non-European peoples was a decidedly subsidiary matter for the party. In fact, only in the cases of La Semana Tragica, The Tragic Week in Barcelona, 25th of July to the 2nd of August 1909, precipitated by the Spanish government's calling up of reserve troops to be sent to Morocco as reinforcements for the Second Rif War, 
and the resistance in Italy to the conquest of Libya two years later? Was there any mass resistance in Europe to colonial wars? In both instances, the struggle against colonial expansion was secondary to the struggle against reactionary forces directly threatening the labor movement itself. The history of British labor is, according to Tillman, determined by the preponderance of the struggle for, quote, the direct material and social interests of the British workers, much more than by democratic principles. The relative success of this struggle in the context of British capitalism's outward expansion explains the endurance of early to mid-19th century liberal and humanitarian ideals on the center-left. On the whole, British labor's internationalism was selective, preferring limited practical cooperation to democratic principle. The domestic counterpart of social imperialism, with the national economy bolstered by imperialist capital, was a reformist attempt to integrate the increasingly numerous middle-class workers into capitalism's integumon. In the 1880s and 1890s, a number of small, newly formed socialist groups in Britain advocated resistance to the formal imperialism of the period. These were anti-expansionist rather than anti-colonialists. They influenced the indifference and hostility of many workers to the Boer War, but they were not always more popular than the jingoism of the imperialist lobby. As Tickleman concludes, quote, The empire was accepted virtually by everybody, as became evident after the Boer War. End quote. Nonetheless, the Independent Labor Party, ILP, affiliated to the Labor Party from 1906 to 1932, presented a somewhat more critical social democratic and pacifist view of imperialist policy than either the Labor Party itself or the Trade Union's Congress, TUC. Yet it did not achieve great popularity with its stance, and it remained muted in any case. By the turn of the last century, a pro-colonialist trend had become clearly discernible within the European socialist movement while an opposite line emerged holding that colonial independence was a precondition for socialism in the metropoles. At the 6th Congress of the Socialist International held in Amsterdam in August 1904, Dutch Social Democrats proposed a narrowly defeated resolution espousing the legitimacy of socialist colonialism. While disagreeing with the colonial policies pursued by the Dutch government, Addressing the Congress was veteran Dutch socialist Henri van Kool. A year earlier, he had described the benevolence of the colonial project as overseen by socialists such as himself in his book Uit Onse Kolonien, From Our Colonies. We must, he implored, lead this people lovingly, augment the riches of the country as benevolent caretakers, and increase the wealth of its inhabitants. In this magnificent country, we will support these good people when they stumble in their suffering path to the sublime. End quote. Though presenting himself as sympathetic to the interests of the indigenous inhabitants of the East Indies, the book's characterizations of them, the indolent Javanese, the dishonest, self indulgent Ambionese, the Chinese coolie with his revolting homosexual habits, reveals a less supportive outlook. At any rate, Van Kohl generously donated some of the profits from his coffee plantation in Java to his home country's markedly liberal labor movement. End of section.